Good morning, everyone. And again, my, uh, my thanks for making the miserable drive out this morning for the lousy weather. Um, first off, uh, PNC, it might be a name you're not used to, but it's the old Mercantile Bank. We became part of the PNC family about a year ago. And everybody asks what PNC stands for. Well, the simplest thing to remember is it's a pretty nice company. <laughs> but we are the bank uh, uh, that I think is the greatest place to work in the world. We have around 1,100 branches here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, thousands of ATMs and a great workforce that offers everything from saving for students all the way to retirement plans. My area of responsibility is workplace and university banking and it kind of makes a statement as to why I'm here. Uh, but I would like to give you a little background on Anuj Danda, our Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer. He is a member of the PNC Financial Services Group and in his role there, he leads our technology organization for consumer and institutional businesses. Mr. Donda joined PNC back in 1995 as Senior Vice President in Small Business Lending. In 1997, he was appointed to the Division Manager in Business Banking with responsibility for New Jersey, uh, Philadelphia, and the Delaware markets. In 1999, he moved up to the Pittsburgh area and was named Chief Information Officer for the Regional Community Bank and was given the additional responsibility of Chief Information Officer for the Wholesale Bank in 2003. Prior to coming to PNC, Mr. Donda uh, worked at JP Morgan, which many of you know is the old uh, chemical bank, for six years, where he was Senior Vice President with Marketing and Strategic Planning Accountabilities. Prior to that, he was Senior Planning Officer in the Technology and Operations area. Mr. Donda serves as chairman of the board for the directors of the Mattress Factory Museum and is a member of the advisory board for Carnegie Mellon University uh, in their computer sciences uh, area. Uh, Anuj has received his PhD in management from Rutgers, where he was the recipient of the uh, very prestigious Sohn Excellence uh, Fellowship. He also taught as an adjunct professor at Rutgers um, in their school of business. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Anuj Danda and uh, have his little uh, conversation with you guys about technology here in the, uh, the financial services world. Nudge, can you come Thank up, you. please? <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. You know, talk about pressure. You have weather like this, and you uh, want to make sure that you say something of importance to all the people who braved this. And then the, the title here is Visionaries in Information Technology, and God knows what visionary means. Uh, certainly, I don't know whether I would qualify for a visionary, but uh, I'm really delighted to be here to talk to you about uh, what's happening in uh, technology and financial services. The only thing I would also warn you is I have never uh, done a technology course in my life. So, but I think I'll just start by saying that as a CIO, uh, the most critical thing that we do is to say, how do we leverage the technology uh, for growing our business? So in that case, you got to know what's happening in the business, and you got to know how to leverage technology. And I think over time is what I've learned technology as I grew up in the business side. And uh, that is something I think, uh, as you will see uh, today, that. Uh, in banking and financial services, technology has become really, really core to the business. It's no more of a support function. So Jim did a customary thing on PNC. Uh, we are a great company. Um, we obviously have developed a lot of presence in your area over the last couple of years, first with the Riggs acquisition, then with Mercantile. We believe this is very, very uh, uh, important market for us and you will continue to see us invest in this market as well as grow the market. Also, I would say from a PNC standpoint, uh, we are, uh, over the last five years, are probably the top performing bank in our peer group. Uh, we have no subprime exposure, and that is one thing that we have sidestepped, and hence, uh, we are focused on growing the bank while others have to deal with all the mess they've created. So this is one thing we're pretty proud of. Uh, but also, I would say is we have a fairly diversified business model, and I think as you will, as we will talk about technology, uh, one of the things we have to always worry, uh, think about is how do we support all the different businesses 
that we have and the diverse businesses we have from ranging from the retail business or the small business, corporate banking, wealth management, and we have a fairly large mutual fund processing business called PFPC. So the key messages we want to talk about first is how the role of technology has changed. Um, and many of you may have an appreciation and some uh, as you're getting to know banking may not as well. But technology really started in the back office in banking and that's where we had a big application of technology. And then over the years as we have progressed, today it is really becoming an information business and increasingly so, and technology plays more and more of a central role. The second kind of message I would tell you is, at least when we see, and we, are, and we just went through a strategic plan exercise, when we see the future, we see in the next two to three years at least, uh, huge changes in application of technology as kind of introduction of new technologies. We'll continue to see evol uh, evolution of the technologies we have. We'll probably see more mobile technology, RFIDs, and a bunch of things. But I think it, uh, we, don't, we, we don't see something as revolutionary as the internet coming on in the next three years. But we see equally so that we will see a lot of application of technology, and we'll tell you more about that. The third one, which is, I think, uh, fairly uh, obvious, but the pace of change is really accelerating. So whatever we used to do in uh, 10 years, we now do in a year. What we did in a year, we do in like two months. And, and I think at, at, the, at each successive period, the change is rapidly changing. And which is also uh, kind of really disruptive in the marketplace. But disruption in the marketplace is always also an opportunity to do well. So in any market disruption, there are winners and losers. And if you play it right, I think the opportunity is really to say, how do you kind of win in a place when there's so much disruption in the marketplace? And I'll give you some examples about that. Also, the business is becoming far more complex. Because as we have applied more technology, as information becomes more available to a wide uh, set of people, you got to have different controls, and the business becomes model becomes much more complex. We'll talk a little bit about that, too. And from my perspective, I'd say the winners would be, and winners in banking or winners in financial services would be people who understand the strong alignment between business and technology and how to align technology with the business in a way that it's not a support function, it is not about technology on the side, but an integrated view to the business. And second and probably the most important message I'll leave, and especially on this side of the house, is we really believe people are central to our success. And uh, we'll, I'll tell you more about how uh, we are accelerating our college recruiting for interns, uh, for full-time positions, and we would have a lots of opportunities. But I think if we're going to win, I think cultivating you all at this time is key to our success. And finally, I would say is, as the technology world becomes more global, uh, managing the risk and governance would be a core competency that we would have. So, You'll hear uh, those would be the key messages that I will uh, walk through. So when we start with how the world has changed. You know, I was uh, invited to, um, CMU launched a program for, called Masters in Innovation. It's a master's program in innovation in the School of Engineering. Very interesting program. To launch the program last year, they had a seminar. And they invited uh, someone from uh, the, uh, general manager at US Steel, uh, the strategy person from Heinz, uh, someone from Siemens, uh, the chief, technology, uh, chief design officer for Ford Motor Company, and myself. So first, when I got the invitation, I was a little kind of chuckled to myself, and I said, this is a thing, an innovation, and they're inviting a banker to an innovation. You know, I, we really don't think of ourselves as very innovative, generally. And, uh, so we were all going through and talking about what has happened in our industries and how we've used technology to drive innovation. And so the US Steel, if you can imagine, they talked about 100 years of steel making and how technology has changed and how st make, making steel has evolved. And when my turn came, I really, in fact, that gave me pause to think that if you think about us, 30 years ago, uh, and some of you were not around at that time, but uh, some of us were, 
I mean, 30 years ago, banking was very, very different. Uh, banks were limited to being within a state, sometimes within a county. So there were no this 1,200 branches uh, uh, banks. Citibank used to be a bank limited to uh, New York City. We used to have we used to call these money center banks. We had no bank, I think, greater than 20 billion or 30 billion in assets. Uh, the only banking we did was branch banking. Capital markets were hardly well, uh, developed. We had a stock exchange, of course, but the, most of the products that you see today in derivatives and all the stuff all came after that. Uh, cash management for companies was very, very rudimentary. And uh, customers had almost no choice. In fact, banking used to be known as 363, which was you paid 3% on deposits, charged 6% on loans, and 3 o'clock on the golf course. That used to be banking. It was pretty straightforward, actually, in those days. But if you look today, how many channels we have and how we interact with the customer from uh, workplace, university banking, to online, we're doing our uh, RFID cards, and it, every day we're adding mobile, we're adding all different channels that we compute with the, uh, with the customers. We have thousands of branches, um, online banking, and then on the corporate side, increasingly far more complex of products, uh, complexity in products, in how we interact, uh, access of um, information. And it has really fundamentally changed what the business model is all about as we have become much more of an information business. And what has really powered these, these are the, some of the inflection points, I would say, in banking, uh, was interstate banking. Because that was the first time that we got some scale. Because when you had only fewer branches, you couldn't invest and really kind of make it work across a wide geography. So once we got interstate banking going, that was the real start of innovation and advancement in banking. The second part, I think, is I think the most fundamental uh, thing has happened in, and I'm not saying anything that you guys don't see it every day, is the internet. I think that has really changed how information flows as well as how banking or financial services is done uh, in, in, in a very, very profound way. The other thing which internet has really done is for the first time in the IT world given us standards. And I think those standards have really allowed us to uh, uh, do development in a fashion which is very different, uh, much more um, efficient, effective, uh, and really change how we do business. Uh, in fact, I remember in the early 90s when people would talk of standards, it was stand like IBM would talk of standards and standards were what IBM standards or Unisys or whoever was talking, their standards were like, we are open standard meant we might talk to another company or another kind of operating system. And think about today, really it is an open kind of standards world. And then what 9-11 did for the financial services, it, it taught us risk management which many of, us, many of us had forgotten or didn't know, realize how important risk management was. When people couldn't kind of get, uh, like Bank of New York might have taken, no matter, six weeks for them to come back to stream after 9-11 because we didn't have good business resiliency, we didn't kind of, we started thinking about how do we protect customer information and realized we had a lot of work to do. And we have really changed the world since 9-11 in terms of how we manage information. On the technology side, you can also imagine that a lot has changed. And again, if you, uh, and the reason to share this is not that you're making, I'm making anything profound statement, but more to share with you to give you perspective of how things have happened in the last 25 years. And if you think about the uh, most computing environment was mainframe. And people thought when PCs came, mainframes will go away. Well, today we do more uh, computing in mainframes than any time ever before. And yet, we have far more uh, computing on now on uh, distributed computing with servers and PCs. So we have just do a lot more computing. But if one thing I think you would take away on this slide on technology, which is, I think, fundamentally changed, is network. And if I had one prediction to make as a non-technologist, I would say we would see a lot more progress, a lot more uh, intelligence built around the network over time. Because one thing the network allowed this whole offshore thing is, because, is made possible because of the advancement in network. So as the network standards, it became more standardized. The, the cost points really dropped. 
all of a sudden the world has changed in terms of how we communicate and how we carry uh, the, uh, and, and also because of the network, the security has industry has really changed. And over time, at least I see more intelligence in the network. So, and even some of the computing environment, I think would get more linked to the network. But that has really, really, I think allowed us to have a world uh, where we can fully leverage the internet. And I think over time, uh, the network becomes more mobile, so we have less of that, uh, less uh, connection on landline. But network will keep driving, I think, a lot of the advent in technology. So what has that done to the role of technology in banking is we have moved from the back office, which we did in the 80s, and we had, if you can imagine, we do millions of pieces of paper uh, we move every day. And all the automation we had on a mechanical basis applied in the uh, 1980s. And then we moved to the front office because we said, you know, this is great, but how do we really bring any value to a customer when we're talking to them in the front office? So we started saying, hey, you know, we ought to know about the customer, about all that they do, uh, across channels, multi-channel stuff we started talking about. And then we said, you know, maybe we get directly linked to the uh, customer over the last, you know, in the uh, early 2000s with online banking and, and, the, uh, and, and technologies that started connecting us directly to the customer. But now we are at a stage where information is increasingly becoming the business. So if you look in our corporate banking or capital markets, where a lot of stuff was done on a lot of intuition, it's increasingly becoming an information-driven business in terms of what, how you manage your book is largely driven by what information you have. And the quality of the information allows you to manage your risk in ways that only the right analytics would allow you. The returns are really kind of to the, uh, are related to how the quality of those analytics. The timing of uh, those analytics and information has become uh, critical. And today you can't imagine a world where all that information flow that we have in capital markets that you could do business. I'll talk a little more about healthcare. Uh, PNC is making a fairly big investment in healthcare payments. And I will tell you that the whole healthcare payments industry is really centered on information. And sometimes you even wonder what, what does a, is a bank doing there? Uh, but I think banking business increasingly is also about information. So we see a real kind of tight connection to banking uh, in healthcare. When we think about how are we going to get our brand to come alive, a lot of times we have to think about is how would we le leverage technology to connect with the customers? And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. But I think today, that's why I think in most of the ca in, in financial services, what you find is that technology and information is no more a staff function like you know legal used to be or, or sometimes finance. It is really say, and, and even my CEO looks to me and says, hey, I'm counting on you. And that's why you also see a trend that a lot of business people or uh, CIOs have business background because you got to understand the business if you're going to be effective uh, leverage of technology. So uh, what I thought is I'll share uh, some uh, things on what's happening in the, uh, from what we see, some of the key changes on the customer side, some key changes on technology, and then talk a little bit about what does it mean for implications, uh, how we manage technology, and how do we win with technology. And then we'll pause and do question and answers. Uh, that's something that I think I would probably enjoy the most. So if you think about payments, and payments to us is how you really kind of uh, leverage the financial services or, or banking, whether you're using a debit card, credit card, check, cash, uh, any way, uh, wire, ACH, uh, all those channels that you use. Uh, but look at the dramatic change that we have. And we, in 90, as uh, well, 10 years ago in 96, we, it was a really a check and cash society, 85% transactions. And then the 15% includes all the credit card, ATMs, debit card, online was all only 15%. And look at today, is 43%. Now the, the challenge for the bank is the following. Since we now have we 43% uh, or and growing, we are investing heavily in the electronic channels. But guess what? 
we need the entire infrastructure to manage all the paper payments too. So all our check processing, all our branch inv investments, we have to have all those investments to keep in place, add all the transaction for electronic. So the, the fundamental challenge that remains in banking for us is the cost of providing the service across all these channels keeps going up. And you know, some customers use never go to the branch, but guess what? Some people, most people would like to open uh, their account in the branch. So they would like to go to branch. So we, have, we are still opening a lot of branches these days. And you know, we couldn't just come into Maryland and say, hey, we want to be, PNC wants to banking. We had, to, uh, we had an uh, merger with Mercantile, and all the Mercantile branch presence got us really in the game. So the fundamental challenge in banking becomes is, how do we leverage technology in a way which is efficient that we can manage this mix and a growing mix, keep investing, and yet keep our revenue to cost ratio in line? And which is, I think, really the challenge. And this other, on the other side, you look at the consumers, and they have fundamentally changed how they do business with us. So if you look at online banking, 60% uh, in a couple of years, we believe, would be doing, would use online as their primary channel. Today, it is, I think, around 45 or, or thereabouts. Uh, but again, uh, we have to say, is, as we invest in online banking, how do we make sure that we have all the stuff in our branches, all the stuff in the call center, all the ATMs, so all that cost and all the convenience that we pro would provide all needs to be maintained while we're investing in new channels. Uh, another area that I talk about customer-driven changes is online banking. And this is just a PNC story to tell you on online banking, that how we treated online banking is very, very different. When we, to even I would say a couple of years ago, we regarded it as a, ch a channel in a, as part of a multi-channel delivery. We thought of it as saying, hey, how we could do, make some progress, uh, present a unified brand. Uh, we went to one site, pnc.com, and where we, you know, we used to have, I don't know, as uh, over the last 10 years, maybe 30 sites, so we went down to one site. So we did all the basics, I would say, uh, pretty well, because we wanted to be kind of competitive in the channel. But now, we are really in a different ball game. This is how we would differentiate ourselves. So, let me talk to, again, my friends on the right side of the house. We're developing websites and, and saying, how do we really do business with the Gen Y? And interestingly, we, uh, story is, we hired a company called IDO to work with us because most of us, when we think about you know, doing stuff on online banking, we start with, we have checking accounts, savings accounts, cards. That's how the language we speak. Well, many of these people don't speak that language. They think about, hey, I have some money. I spend somewhere. I save something. And maybe I can move uh, how that happens. So what this company really does is they have a group of anthropologists, psychiatrists, computer scientists, and they all work together to figure out how does the emotional value of this thing really work. Uh, what are emotions attached to when people do different aspects of banking? In fact, on our uh, behalf, they went to Korea to really check out how does it happen in Korea because they're far more advanced actually using electronic banking. And they use a lot of stuff on their card, all the stuff they do on buses, tr trams, a lot of it is driven on card base. But the, but the point I would say is we would now in uh, June start rolling out and I would say to the PNC team here, that will be something that I think you'd find interesting as you are uh, uh, in universities, to say that we fundamentally start changing on how we do banking in Gen Y and how they approach it. So just to give you a sense, uh, with a click of a, uh, as you move a, uh, a mouse, we'll be able to transfer money. Now, we're not telling you we're transferring. You're saying, hey, I want to save. Uh, I have so much money and this is what I want to use for, to pay my bills and this is what I want to invest. This is what I want to put my money in this bucket, that bucket. So we will never talk about accounts to you. We'll talk about you have money and you could do what you want with it with a click of a mouse. Now in the background we'll do transfers into accounts and all the different stuff. But we'll change how, uh, we'll, we'll be identify ourselves with how you think about money as opposed to how we think about money. And which is, I think, a fundamental change that we would need to make if we are going to be successful. And I think you'll see a whole series of changes from us 
uh, in a way that we really kind of start thinking about saying, so how do you think about retirement? As opposed to, so from a banker's standpoint, how do you think of retirement? You have 401k, you have this, you have this, you have that. But we really ought to say is, hey, what are my retirement goals in a fashion you identify clearly? And then we say, how does a bank really work with you as opposed to saying, I have these seven products, which one can I, can I, would you buy and what might suit you? But I think really work to say, how do you want to create your retirement plan? And then we become an enabler as opposed to our definition of products. Um, another example, as I was talking about, is a customer-driven chain really has become is the information business. Because I think banking interest increasingly is becoming all about the information that we have. And healthcare is one place where I think it's really showing up for us. So if you think about healthcare, um, and you think, imagine yourself uh, that there is a provider like a hospital, and then there are insurance companies. Any hospital people here? Okay, then I can talk about them. Uh, insurance too. Uh, fairly inefficient way in terms of how we do business today. Uh, in terms of how we transmit uh, information, the claim information, I think the thinking is we, uh, there are 50 billion transactions that happen between the, uh, the hospitals and the insurance companies, 50 billion. And even if you think there's a dollar a transaction, think about the money we are investing. And a lot of that is pretty straightforward, complex, but straightforward, but very little automation today because there are very, little, very few standards. But if we can, the thinking is, if you could automate this, you can imagine the billions that we would be able to save uh, for the, and the, at, the end, to the, at, at the end, really for the consumer. But the, the trick in this really is to be able to identify, hey, how does the business work at the, uh, at the hospital? How do you look at what insurance contracts you have? What plans you, uh, you have? what uh, treatment is allowed, how to do it up front, how to get permissions up front so that everything is online, efficient, that works for the end, at the end of the day for the consumer, but allows the hospital to sell its service in a different fashion. And then at the back end to really have a remittance process which is really efficient so that the bank can kind of provide that service. But increasingly what we would find ourselves is we are becoming into the information business on this claim processing and remittance because the two are becoming a lot tightly connected. So the, most of the banks will be providing the entire service of saying, how do you go claim information back and forth? How do you send money back and forth, connect the two, and be able to provide intelligence to the hospital and the insurance company? And this is one area where I think uh, where the banking and the information uh, business becomes one. And I think we, it, it would be, in my view, an adjacent territory that we are going to go to. A uh, lot of technology-driven changes, too, and I'll just kind of keep it at a high level, and I thought maybe if we have questions, we could talk about it. But I think a lot of changes in technology, obviously, going on. But this, the, the, the couple of the biggest changes in my mind is, the first one is virtualization. And virtualization is really why it is so fundamental is, again, is I think it's giving us the scalability. Um, on average, I think this is a correct statistic. Uh, on average, it, as an industry, we use 8% of the CPU capacity we have on servers. Eight, zero eight. So or said another way, 92% of the time, we're not leveraging what we bought. As, not as this is not banking, this is the entire industry. And the reason is that we have all ded dedicated applications running on dedicated servers. So we have one application and, and typically we would have a production environment, we'll have a QA environment, we have a test environment. So we'll set up servers for each kind of environment for every application. And by the way, if you want failover, then you put another server down. And if you have a little more volume, then you becomes two by two by two by two. So in fact, yesterday, uh, my team had come to talk to me for a letter of credit and PNC is not the biggest player in a lot of credit business. They wanted 32 servers to, to replace uh, eight servers they had before because we're adding environments and we wanted to do this. And so the, the point I'm trying to make is it's expensive, it's very difficult to maintain uh, because you have that many uh, servers. So virtualization is a big, big uh, challenge for us. 
And I think with the new technologies that we have and maturity in the virtualized industry, I think that will become a big uh, deal. And virtualization on the network, virtu it's across the kind of computing environment, virtualization I think would be really important. The second I think is, as I was saying, linked to scalability, but also the complexity. Um, as technology has become a lot more powerful, it has also become a far more complex than it ever was. So for the practitioners in us, we have to really figure out how do we manage that complex environment? The tools we need and the proactivity we need, as well as the importance of technology to the consumers and to the corporate customers. In fact, now if our, uh, the, our corporate online uh, uh, banking, which we call Pinnacle, if it is down for 15 minutes, that's a huge deal because so many corporate treasurers are investing hundreds of millions of dollars based on how much money they have, what where the money is going, and they're making decisions in the moment. So now, if your system is not available, you just took out 15 minutes of opportunities for them. And by the way, if you took out 15 minutes of opportunity and it happened, some major market movement happened within the 15 minutes, guess what, who they're talking to? You, and saying, hey, it's your system, and who the, all the uh, business managers talking to me and say, hey, your system needs a different level of availability. And while the complexity in the environment is exponentially increasing. So that's why I think uh, really it is an important kind of thing to say, how do we manage that, those complex environments? The third thing which I'd also say is, which is really important is uh, safeguarding customer information. We, as the information, and, and primarily through internet, but even other channels as it has become more digital, that information is easily, also the bad guys can get access to the information easily. And I think we have to really think about saying, how do we really safeguard that information? We're making a lot of investments. Um, not good. We've not had any uh, serious lapse there. But as an industry, I think it is a huge deal to say, how do we safeguard our customer information? And finally, I would say is, as the environment has become more global, to really say how the risk, manage and, risk management and governance becomes really, really critical in, uh, in this uh, complex environment. So the first thing I would say is from the implication standpoint is get committed to a business model. And this is really for the, uh, the banking industry. We have to figure out which model do we play in. Because based on what you play in, depends what would you do. So every day of the week, we compete with all the large banks. And some banks, some of the banks like Citibank or Bank of America are eight times, nine times our size. And obviously they invest that much more, they have that much more complexity. So how we compete with them is really once you get clear on what your model is. So the larger banks would do a lot of build, we do a lot of buy. So I may not have the scale sometimes to compete with Citibank and everything, but I certainly would say Oracle or IBM or ACI or some of the software providers would have the scale. So then for us it becomes important is how we leverage technology as opposed to saying how, do, how much proprietary technology do we have. Um, again, uh, in terms of the workforce, if you want to go to have a labor, uh, global workforce, you got to kind of really have all the standards around it, all the right governance around it. And it is not as easy as saying, hey, can I hire seven programmers in India? And they, we, they, they cost one third the money and isn't life great. It is not as straightforward because you got to have the right governance. You got to know how to leverage uh, people in different locations. You got to know how to manage the customer information, how to manage the customer, uh, the information access. And all those things have to get wrapped around in a fashion that you can really make this happen. And, but as I said, uh, knowing what you're, the game you're playing is really critical. And what also has happened is as the small banks, and there are 8,000 of them, what they have really done is they are really in a, from an information and uh, technology or operations, it's a utility. So there are four or five major providers of uh, technology and operations to these small banks and almost all of them use one of the service bureaus now. Because there's no way they could be able to compete, uh, invest and compete in that business. So there's Pfizer, Medavante, Fidelity, there are four or five of them, 
and it's become a, really a utility play for them. In fact, if you recall, there was a, uh, in Harvard Business Review, there was an article talking about, is IT a utility or is it a differentiator? And this author made a very forceful kind of uh, or provocative view that they said, you know, IT is like electricity, very important, but a utility. And then um, um, Scott McNeely from Sun, and everyone got really kind of enraged, you know, this is our livelihood, how can you ever say that it is information technology is the business, blah, 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 blah. And so there was a big debate. And at least where I, I would end in the debate is to say, it all depends. The computing environments, in my view, or network, is a utility. It's really, like electricity. If we didn't have electricity, imagine the, like this morning we got up, we had no electricity, how screwed up our lives would be. <laughs> you know, to, to, you couldn't take a shower, to, what, what all you couldn't do. So it's really critical, but it is a utility. I don't care where the, where, where the electricity comes from, who's the provider. So I may not compare where the, my information is computed, but I would care what capabilities I have, how I advance the business. If I go on online banking, I would like to kind of say it, it clearly make, would make a difference what capability I have. So I think in, there are aspects of information technology that are a utility, and then there are aspects that are, I think, a really uh, differentiator. Um, the second, I would say, from a pra practitioner, again, from uh, uh, someone like in uh, CIO, is to say, how do I manage technology as a portfolio? Because if I was to try to invest in everything possible, we certainly could not afford it. So we need to know is where, what is really important to the business, what is really important to the customer at the end of the day, and work backwards to say, where am I going to play? What, I'm, what am I going to be known for? And then be able to manage the technology set of investments, where I'm going to be a utility player, and where I'm going to be, have a differentiated play. And the real value that we create uh, for the business is where we, in terms of what differentiation at the end of the day we can cause for the customer. So if you don't see a differentiator between, and, and this is what banks are not good at actually, is really to create any differentiation. Most people think all banks are similar. And I think it's only in the last few years we've really started talking about the brand and say what the brand stands for and how would we create a more differentiated, unique experience for you. So what I think we have to leverage technology to say, what are those uh, inflection points for us as a bank, for other people, to, uh, as their organizations, to be able to create the difference? Next, I'd say, again, how do we create the brand, brand experience come alive as part of the differentiation cycle? And we got to leverage technology in a fashion that makes the brand experience uh, really come alive. So at PNC, we are really talking about centering the brand experience on ease of doing business and letting you achieve your goals with confidence. So now the question is, how does it make it easy? And again, as I was talking about Gen Y, the whole design is around not the way we traditionally thought, but how to say, how do we make it easy for uh, people? And then we're going to take the same approach and say, how do we make it easy for the employees? How do we make it easy for all different segments and be able to kind of reach out to different segments in a fashion that really works for you? Uh, again, given that we have limited resources, as every company would, or in any organization, to be able to say it is really critical also that we have enterprise leverage, especially where there is utility. And also to play the game to say if you all try to centralize and everything is, uh, you may not have the uh, ability to be innovative and have the creative differentiation. So the, what I think, and the, that's the reason I reuse, use the word optimize. Because the word optimize really says is, you need to know how much enterprise leverage will you have, how much innovation will you have, and you gotta kind of have a good balance to be able to do both. And last, at least, this is uh, my way of saying, I think it's really about the people. So technology may be about bits and bytes, but it's really about people. Uh, how we have uh, people at, uh, management levels, how we have people entering our workforce. And it is also something we don't sometimes pay as much attention. So at least for me, this is my single biggest priority. 
the people that we how we hire people and the people that we have how do we kind of really make sure that they have challenging roles uh, that we keep our interests and we're able to keep our best people and grow our people and that's at least I would say uh, <clears throat> It would be my kind of uh, really great desire that uh, we form this partnership, uh, Sheldon, with the University of Maryland, and really see a lot of your graduates come to PNC because I really think this is a fundamental kind of uh, differentiator for us and uh, core competency for us. And I think we certainly would look to partner with you to do more of that. Uh, I just thought I'll just encapsulate what PNC, uh, how we would characterize our technology strategy. But if you look at the formula, as I call it, is really to say the most important thing is we remain committed and aligned with the business. So there is no wastage in technology. We really are focused on what would we do and then really get focused on how do we get leverage out of technology. We get win all kinds of awards for technology, but more, almost all the awards we win is how we create value out of technology, not that we use the technology the first, way, or the first time or we are the first to the market with the technology, but the idea is when you have some technology, how do you create value out of that? That's the, and that's where, where the alignment with the business is that critical. Uh, again, given our size, uh, we need to make sure we are focused. So we're not investing in everything, but the focus that we make, we, we need to make sure that we have much uh, higher batting percent. We leverage as much as possible for the centralized uh, and optimize the central uh, 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 versus decentralized uh, approaches. Core competency, m and uh, even, uh, how many of you are PNC customers? Show of hands. Well, I think there's a big sales opportunity here too, Mojam guys. Uh, but I would say is, I think for those of you, I hope as you went through the mercantile conversion, you would say that we had a fairly uh, seamless conversion. This is something we've kind of developed over time. And each time we learn some lessons, so it's not, I would say this is 100% flawless, but close to 100% flawless is the approach that we would go for. And finally, I would say, you got to kind of uh, uh, center this in, in, a, in an architecture that is congruent and uh, is, uh, can leverage all the different investment and needs that we would have. So in conclusions, I'd say is, People, in my view, would, would be, who would be successful uh, or, and winners would be people who can really uh, align business and technology. And I, in my mind, this is a big, big challenge. This is, it's not something that happens naturally. You got to work at it, and I think it's really critical that you, people who are in technology understand the business, people in business understand technology. Relentless focus on people, and as I've said a couple of times now is, I think that's how we're going to be successful if we have, we are hiring the right people and then we have really uh, those people be challenged and grow. Uh, strong risk management and governance, especially as the world becomes more global. And there's no kind of uh, denying the fact that I think we will become, we are becoming more global and over time the world would be flatter. So I think, but having, the only way this way thing works is if you have strong risk management and governance. And I think for people who've gone offshore, you'll hear some stories about how that has not worked or we didn't get the value. I think it's really people who weren't really prepared with a strong governance model. And at the end of the day, this is all about growing the business. So we got to kind of say is, how are we going to use this innovations in technology, know what's happening in the customer world, and then say, how do we marry this two to create value for the business? And that's how we kind of really play a bigger role I think that we grow the business and, uh, and create a competitive advantage at the end. So, um, be happy to take questions at this time. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm Larry Davis and I just retired from Siemens and we do a lot of uh, energy research in Carnegie Mountain, in particular fuel cells. Okay, uh, great. I'd like to comment on two areas. Uh, one regarding RFID, the second regarding your comment about uh, how banks have changed so much. And it seems to me that banks really haven't changed that much, maybe from a technology standpoint, but there are more branch banks, physical buildings than you could ever imagine and they're growing. So I don't know if they're advertising or if they're really that important. I'm curious how much um, use of bandwidth that, that is on your particular network. That's the first question. 
second question deals with RFID technology. As I said, I'm retired, so I'm a little bit older, and I keep losing my credit cards. You talk about having RFID uh, cards. My wife's going to have the chip put in my wrist. <laughs> so I but have you also started to look at biometrics, which can provide not only easy access and having that, having all the cards, but also maybe even a little better security as to who I am, not only at the bank but from my PC that I'd have to enter my biometric. So if you can comment on those two things. Sure. So the first question in terms of is banking change and why are banks still opening branches all the time if uh, banks have really become all the trends we showed you about. Uh, what I think that the banking behavior or the customer behavior that has really changed is uh, something has changed and something hasn't changed. What has not changed is people pick banks based on location. And then they'll open the accounts and most people do not go back to the branches, but would not open bank with you if you did not have a branch. Now there are some successful uh, people who have done it without branches, ING is one of them. Uh, but again in the scheme of things it's a very, very small percent. And especially when you think about small businesses or medium sized businesses, people would not bank, uh, bank with you if you did not have a physical presence. So what we are doing fundamentally different is the branches we're building are different. We have different kind of sizes of branches. The model of branches has changed. Uh, but unless you are, really have a physical presence, you can't do banking. So, and that's the reason I was sharing with you the challenge that we have is, so we are opening more physical branches, more cost structure there, investing more in online stuff, more cost structure there, and the same revenue model. And I think to say, how do we balance it is, is it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. So we're changing in that fashion of saying is there's a much more of a multi-channel delivery with new channels being added, but not re replacing the brand channel. So that's kind of the, I would say, the, the challenge. In terms of RFI, uh, RFID and biometrics, clearly I think what you would see is the industry is moving in a direction uh, of using more RFID. And I think many of our debit cards, we're going to start converting to RFIDs. Uh, the challenge, and, and, and many of the European countries are far ahead on that thing, whether they have RFIDs or, you know, the merging of cell phones and credit cards is starting to happen. Uh, and there are different ways where you can kind of connect pieces. But I think you also pointed out in your question, really one of the biggest challenges is security. So now you have RFIDs, how do you manage with when people lose that card and how, how do you kind of are able to uh, manage and provide a secure environment. And biometrics is potentially a very good answer. Um, what we find today at least is consumers are not as interested or don't feel um, not as open to using biometrics right now uh, from a privacy standpoint. But my sense is that over time that barrier will change. And as we, people get more comfortable over time, and, and also the biometric technology will become more mature. Today, it is not as uh, uh, mature. And I think the consumer behavior, like, you know, if you say, hey, I need a your fingerprint or your retina chain, uh, image, people are somewhat reluctant to kind of think that I, I should do that for, you know, buying $7 of gas or whatever else. So over time, I think it will change because I think behaviors will change in a fashion that will allow that to happen. Um, so I think that's why what we are doing at least is our view is we continue to keep investing in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way of not significant investment, but we are investing in RFID technology for cards. And uh, over time for access management, we're trying our different biometric stuff also. But at a kind of, a, I would say more of an R&D level right now. And as the consumers are more willing to accept uh, that, I think it will uh, change. And as I said, is in Europe, uh, we see a lot more in Korea. Uh, almost a lot, uh, all the tr public transportation is more electronic based than we are. So more to come, I think. Thank you. So, Why do you hold on the um, paper check business with all these problems? Especially you mentioned Europe. I'm coming from Europe, and that's really, really weird. Yeah. You know, it is, uh, I think uh, my answer really is, is what the customer wants. And they, you know, for 
uh, hundreds of years, uh, the American economy has been, or uh, in, uh, our uh, society has been a very much of a check uh, or, uh, writing uh, 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 culture. So it has begun to change. In fact, uh, 2002 was the first year when the number of checks really declined for the first time. We always talked of paperless or checkless society and it has not never happened. But we now see every year we decline in checks. And uh, how many of you use online banking? See, uh, so people who use online banking, I think I would say, oh, Monique, you don't. <laughs> Jim, you gotta take care of this. <laughs> 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 but I think that the question is really is centered in how fast the consumers will change. And, uh, but it is becoming a lot more, uh, it is the volumes have become to decline. The second thing we have also done as an industry is we, when we get a check now, we digitize the check. And from there on, we are only sending images to other banks for collection. And the paper flows, in fact, I think about, if I, if I recall right, the statistic is 80% of the checks that we get, we, after we scan them for the first time, we never use the check paper again. Now, in 20% of the cases, in many cases, where if you're sending check, the other bank is not ready, or there are certain cases where we have to use the original check, but that percent is declining too. So over time, that even when we have checks, if people, customers would use checks, we would make our process a uh, lot more uh, digital. And the, what it'll allow to do is that you'll get your money much faster. So, you know, all the availability that we go through and, and also from a risk standpoint, which is risky for the bank is that while we have the check being sent for collection till it comes back, we're carrying the risk of the check. And so we'll get the money faster and we'll give it to you faster. So I think, uh, again, uh, some consumer behavior, we are certainly encouraging it. We're putting fee structures in place that will allow it to happen, but I think it'll take a little more time. Yes, sir. Uh, you showed a slide up there that showed uh, relative market position for small, medium, and large size banks. And one of the things that I noted was that you only uh, show the large banks dealing with a lot of the international transactions. I'm wondering how is globalization going to muddy the water on those market positions of the various bank sizes? Uh, at most of the uh, uh, medium-sized banks, so let's start with the easy ones. So the, most of the large banks are becoming global banks. The smaller banks are local banks. So like if you, know, you have five branches or 30, 20 branches and you're local on, on a focus on, on a local community. Where the challenge I think comes in is all the, I'd say a thousand odd medium-sized branches, uh, banks so who are not in the top five and are not in the 8,000 small banks. And I think uh, that is a real challenge that will come over time. That I think from two perspectives, what as the, even the, uh, the businesses become more global in their approach. So even a medium sized company for us, which for us may be a $30 million sales size company, now demands that we have a fair amount of international capability to do, uh, to do business. Uh, and increasingly, so, so as, as PNC, we need to make sure we have that capability. And that, I think, is easier to do. But increasingly, like I was telling you, we have a mutual fund processing business. And in that business, people are, uh, you know, when they pick providers, so like a city bank is picking a provider for mutual fund processing. Now they say, hey, are you a, do you have the breadth of products? So like, can you do custody, sub-accounting, transfer agency? Can you, are you in all these businesses? And two, can you do it on a multi-currency? Because I don't want to be in the business of doing, picking different vendors for different things. So it is a challenge uh, for us. So what I think the way we are adapting to saying is, how do we go into a kind of support a global payments environment without being having physical global presence? And uh, I think that's the kind of where role of technology comes in to say, how do you enable multi-currency accounting uh, support that aspect, but without having uh, presence in all the uh, different parts of the world, because that's a really a different business model. I want to know more about, you talked about change in technology, but in light of the regulatory environment that Ninth face, or I'll say perceived regulatory environment, I recently had three CDs at my, and it's a money center bank, large bank, 
that matured. The first one I opened through the branch. The other two I did online. When the first one came due, they insisted I had to come into the branch again to roll that CD over. And I actually had to let that CD mature, deposit it into my bank account, in order for me to roll it over online without a signature. And when you went into the branch, they said, oh, we don't know how you did that online. I was saying, well, it's your own website. Right. Uh, and the same thing happened with the uh, home equity. We talked about transferring money. I can transfer money now overnight between my brokerage account and another institution in the bank. But the bank, I also have a line of credit, and it still takes two days to get that money into my account. Now, if you bank at PNC, you won't have the problem. So that's the first thing. Right? <laughs> so that's the first answer. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the reason you see a lot of this uh, issues, and I would, would, if I was being truthful, I would say we might have some glitches here and there. But by and large, I think we are a much better multi-channel uh, institution than most others, uh, is that most of these channels were developed one at a time. So to a consumer, which is absolutely appropriate for you to think, to say, hey, to me, you're one bank and it's your website, your branch, your call center, why won't you talk to each other rather than me having to track on different kind of channels and different time frames? But since they were developed one at a time, I think that people are still kind of cleaning some of that things up. Uh, the other aspect I would say on the regulatory side, uh, we certainly have seen more regulatory uh, pressures than ever before, both from a compliance standpoint as well as uh, safeguarding uh, 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 perspective. And increasingly, it is a, a, a fairly difficult environment to be compliant with everything. But on the other hand, it is also provides our safety. So one of the things, at least I uh, believe, is that financial services, or banks in particular, have to be like inspire confidence in you that it is a safe place, that your money is safe. And one of the things that regulators do for us as a real service is ensure that we are safe. And, you know, sometimes it's really painful how they do it, but by and large, I think they do provide a great service in making sure. And I think at least what we find is in a lot of cases, uh, the regulators have become uh, real good partners in terms of saying, how do we partner up to make sure that the banks are kind of uh, strong, provide, a, and, and they're also watching for the uh, consumer. But now on the um, uh, complaining side, if I look at Sarbanes-Oxley, I tell you, you wouldn't believe the amount of work we have to do uh, to be compliant. Now, how much of that value did we add? I think there was clear value added to say, hey, there is more confidence in the financial statements that we put out. But the way we get there, like for bank our size, we have 453 IT controls, IT uh, controls that we have to independently test. We test, management test, audit test, and an in, in, in outside uh, auditor test, 453 controls in IT before we could say the statements are fair. Like, come on, give me a break. We, you know. So the, the, the way it's, I think it will, over time it'll get itself corrected, but I think that some of those things need, get, need to get cleaned up. But I think inside of uh, saying that uh, a regulatory environment is a, uh, an asset at the end of the day for us. Um, and I think the more, of, more and more you will see that on your first question, that things will become truly multi-channel uh, so that you can pick up a conversation or a processing at any one channel and uh, pick up the other. I think over time that will certainly happen. Yes, sir. You talked about Jan Wise uh, and how to deal with it as a consumer. It's changing. It's evolving. It's how they, they function, how they work. Um, with a lot of the baby boomers retiring and the Jan Wise coming into the workforce, the way they learn is different as well. I have sure. a one-year-old son who can be on the PlayStation, listen to the iPod, and text at the same time. So these folks, a lot of the folks in the room here, learn very differently. And so what is PNC doing to prepare for that? Two, uh, great question. Great qu so two things I would say. One, are we preparing to say, how do we offer financial services to this generation in a way that works for them? And that's what I was describing to you, that how, in fact, in starting in June, we would have a different approach relating to this, to, to this generation. And then there are some things that we would do with them that we would uh, transport over to the world at large. 
So uh, another aspect that what we uh, as we understood the research would show is they think of banking not more in a, like a calendar way. Uh, I got paid. This is when I paid as opposed to the way we typically would display bank uh, transactions saying, you know, you got deposited and give you transaction view. We don't give you a calendar view. So the first thing when you come to the website, you will see a calendar view of and by date, like in a calendar, when you got paid, when you got money, what did you spend, when did you save, all the different aspects. So I think there is, uh, we will keep continue to work on saying what that works for the generation. The second thing I think, which is something I think is we are not doing as good a job is to say, how do we prepare for this workforce? So if you think about PNC, right? So most of these people would get a laptop on a Wi-Fi and it works everywhere on campus. You come to the bank, now all of a sudden, bye-bye Wi-Fi because we have all this access management and all these different things that we go uh, with. So, and that is something that I have to tell you right now we have, I've just appointed someone to uh, focus on it and say, really, how will the environment at PNC change where we can leverage the technology? We can kind of do the web 2.0 type of social networking. Uh, we could do Wikipedias and different things, which we have not done as well as an industry, but as a uh, organization too. And it is something that I would say we are really focused on because these guys ain't gonna be happy when they come and work for us and they so like, in fact, I, I have a 17-year-old son. And uh, I said something about how I, he said, how do you communicate? And I said, with email. And to me, like, I'm fairly progressive that I use email. And he says, Dad, you are like the CIO. You don't, you use email and not instant messaging? Like, are you crazy or what? But he didn't say that, by that crazy part. But his implicit, implicit thing was, how can it be? And to me, like uh, email is progressive enough almost. So what I'm saying is we have to change that in thinking if we're going to be ready for these guys. Can I do one more question? Uh, how about the, uh, the students? We're not, I'm not leaving until you ask a question. <laughs> okay. Um, you're talking about the trends in like the um, increase in the trend of technology-driven banking as opposed to branch-based banking. And I was just wondering, at, just in this room alone, we have like a blend of different generations, some of which grew up with very little computer or technology-based input, and some of us who have basically lived our whole lives around a computer. So what I'm asking is, what, what is the banking industry in, in general doing to provide a, like a branch-based support to the older generations while integrating to a more internet and technology-based marketing or banking strategy for the newer generations? Um, I, I think as your question suggests, we have to do both. And some, any, everything in between. Because I think what you would find is that people you use branch to open accounts, do some transaction, and then they want to do everything online or do it on the phone. So what we're trying to do is, you know, again, change what kind of branches we start opening. They're not as big. Uh, they have much more technology in the, within the branch itself. So we use much uh, uh, less uh, cost and investment there. We're also trying to say what type of employees we'll use over in the branch. So over time, I think, you know, today so we have platform, we have teller. That's how we think of the world, right? Uh, we will, I think, over time see more universal employees. So who can just be bankers to help uh, the customer with whatever they need. And then really keep investing on the online side. And I think as the online capability were to become more robust and internet banking or internet were to become more uh, widely used, I think the uh, world would change. And then the, to the question that he asked, which is I think the really key thing for internally for us to work is to say, and how do we com use common workflows? Uh, do it in a fashion that opening an account is the same across and not like the way we think today is our opening account process is online is different than the call center, different than in the branch. It needs to be one across as an industry. So uh, we get leverage from those aspects. And I think one of the things we are realizing is, so I'll give you a quick data point. Uh, if you go to online banking and if you're a student and you want, or, or your workplace and you want to open an account, I think we ask you for 13 or 14 data fields that you need to open an account. If you go to the branch, it becomes 36. 
because we need to do know your customer, we need to do all, some bank imposed, some regulators imposed, but it's crazy. <laughs> well, we can open an account on online, so what we are now examining and saying, if we gotta be easy to do business, how can we do this? So some of that kind of things have to be get sorted out so that it makes it easy in that fashion. And the learnings come from both places. We have time. Great